Hello and welcome to the Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Sammy Worthy. With me today, of course, is co-founder of the Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And today we're very honored to be joined with, by a very special guest, uh, Professor Jeffrey Roberts of University College Cork in Ireland. Um, Jeff is an eminent um, military and diplomatic historian, uh, particularly of the uh, Soviet era. He has written many great books about um, uh, Stalin and uh, World War II. Uh, and uh, he's an excellent writer and an excellent historian. So we're very privileged to uh, be the beneficiary of uh, his insights. So, so I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the what happened on February the twenty fourth is uh, a giant, monumental uh, historical event. The full outcome, implications, and magnitude of which we we're only trying to figure out now. And what started as a special military operations has turned into a major confrontation between uh, Russia and uh, the West. But I, I want to um, quote something that you wrote, I think sometime in March um, about uh, uh, you know, what, what happened. And, uh, and I'll quote, first of all, you say, this invasion is Putin's war, a war of choice, not necessity, the prime responsibility for the conflict and all its, uh, uh, sorrowful, devastating, and dangerous consequences is his. And then you said, as is often the case in decision-making, processes that result in drastic military action, the hard option, the statesmanlike choice, would have been for Putin to persist with diplomacy and accept the risks of remaining at peace with Ukraine. So now, Peter and I are the gaggle. I mean, I think, take, take a somewhat different view of this because we kind of feel that um, Putin and Russia have been trying diplomacy for many, many years, not just on Ukraine, but particularly on NATO expansion. The complaints about uh, NATO expanding has been going on since the 1990s. And the West attitude to Russia's complaints have been dismissive. You know, they pretend to listen, they pretend to take seriously Russia's concerns, but they never, never do anything about them. And we know that however much uh, Russia would have complained about Ukraine and going into NATO, the United States would have eventually pushed and to get Ukraine into NATO, that, that was the goal. They were frustrated in 2008, they haven't given up, Americans never give up, and they would have eventually got Ukraine into NATO. Um, so he could have tried diplomacy, uh, but he wouldn't have achieved very much by it. But, so he decided to um, shuffle the deck. Um, Hard to see what else he could have done in the circumstances. Anyway. If I could just jump in before you answer, Jeff, I think, and I want to clarify here, get Ukraine into NATO. That, I think, in NATO's thinking, particularly in Washington, that would include Crimea and the Donbass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much for, 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 the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's good to see you again, Peter and, uh, and George. Um, just one point of clarification. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an, now an emeritus professor at University College, College, College Cork. Also, <laughs> if you're interested, a member of the Royal Irish Academy. But obviously, I'm speaking, uh, you know, in a personal capacity, as, as always. Yeah, yeah, George, what, what you quoted from, uh, I mean, quite an essay I, I, I wrote, you know, a couple of weeks after uh, the invasion started. And, and I wrote, you know, I wrote that essay to sort of try and, you know, understand what, what, what has happened, because as you said, it was a momentous decision, which huge kind of consequence, potentially catastrophic consequence, and still is, by, by the way. So I was trying to understand why Putin uh, had done, 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 done what he'd done, and, and, and the way I chose to do it was the way, um, uh, yeah, as a historian, and, and actually as a specialist in diplomatic history and foreign policy, I basically reconstructed his decision-making process on the basis of the available evidence. And the available evidence at the moment is, is what he said in the run-up to the invasion. So to try to reconstruct his rationale for what, what he did. Now, the bit you quoted where, where it says it's Putin's war, that's actually from, uh, that's a, that, that was a quote in, in, my, in, my, in my essay from a statement that was issued a few days after the outbreak war by a group of um, Russian studies uh, specialists, a group who, if you look at the names, uh, some of them will be very well known to, you know, to, to both you and Peter, are, are well known 
Ireland in the West as being, you know, as being devoted to building, you know, um, good relations between Russia uh, and the West, and trying to understand the uh, the Russian point of view, being critics of Western policy, uh, you know, to, 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 towards Russia, and and opposing this constant kind of like demonization uh, of, 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 of of Putin, yeah. But still, you know, our view was which we, was that you know. And, you know, is that this was, as, as you quoted, it's Putin's war and he has to take responsibility uh, for for the decisions that he took. But we also went on to say in this statement, as a public statement, was that <laughs> at the same, you know, OK, it's Putin's war, but others also need to bear responsibility for the outbreak of war. The West for not actually um, agreeing to negotiate a reasonable compromise diplomatic settlement, uh, uh, settlement with Russia in relation to Ukraine. The Ukraine for not actually being prepared to, you know, implement the the, the Minsk agreements. Yeah, you know, this was this was a, um, uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> an unavoidable war. It wasn't an, in, an inevitable war. So, so our basic position was that you know we blame the West and the Ukrainians for actually creating this crisis situation in which war becomes a possibility. But nevertheless, it's Putin who takes the fine final decision. Okay, so so okay, but. Why did we oppose it? Why do I still oppose it? It's because the only justification for war is necessity. Yes, that's the only justification there is. Now, I understand that from Putin's point of view, he, considered, he considers this war to be necessary because, because what he saw happening was that you know, Ukraine was being uh, built up, up as a bastion of NATO uh, 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 on Russia's borders uh, with very big dangers that at some point in, uh, in, uh, in the future, Ukraine might, might take action to recover the Donbass and even uh, Crimea, and even the possibility that down the road, Ukraine could, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, could acquire nuclear weapons. And, and that could become part of this uh, you know, threatening uh, uh, scenario. So, so that's my view of why he did it. And I understand those reasons. Um, but sorry, I, I, I disagree. I don't think, you know, I think there was still, um, you know, I, I, I think there was still you know, room for continuing diplomacy. Uh, I, I don't th I don't see the situation as being so urgently kind of like dangerous and, and, and that, well, that he yeah. acted that. But, yeah. but let's say, I'm just like, so that's my view. I disagree. I understand why Putin did what he did, but I disagree with the uh, decisions, with the decision, the decision. And I have to say, what's happened in the war so far hasn't led me to change my mind about that because what, what's happened? Tens of thousands of people uh, are, are being killed. Uh, Ukraine has been, uh, been wrecked. There is this uh, dire confrontation between Russia and the West. Whoever's to blame? There's a possible food starvation. You know, there's still a, you know, a real possibility that there could be some uh, Russian NATO war and some kind of uh, nuclear, uh, nu nuclear exchange. Um, sorry, I, I don't see the danger that was facing Russia in February uh, 2022 as being of sufficient kind of like depth and immediacy that Putin had to take the decision. So I disagree with the decision for what I still do, but nevertheless, I understand uh, the reasons why P Putin felt he had to do what he did. Well, one of the reasons why George and I have taken the position that we have, um, and our position was, um, it has, has not changed. If we can um, draw a line at the December 17th with the two diplomatic notes, one to the US and one to NATO, our line has been very consistent with the outbreak of conf the conflict and to, to this day. And the, the evidence, which is important to historians, is if we look at the um, uh, reporting of the OSCE about the, um, uh, the line of contact, the, the number of shell um, artillery against the Donbass republics increased dramatically. And I'm talking like 3,000%. Like I mean, it, it was really getting hot, really hot. And the vast majority of, and this is the OSCE, it's not me and George. They say that the, 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 it, when we look at the exchanges, the vast majority, it was incoming to the Donbass. This was an indication of what was going on. That is why, in my opinion, um, uh, Putin, uh, um, through state mechanisms, recognized the two Donbass republics, immediately had a um, um, uh, defense pact with them because it, uh, it appeared, and I hope uh, um, you as an historian will be able to uh, make our case because George and I don't have the evidence in front of us, but it looks very likely that the, the Donbass was going to be attacked. 
we add to that, and George and I use only Western sources, the Washington Post and the New York Times, in the, at the end, <clears throat> last quarter of uh, 2021, massive amounts of, um, of uh, ammunition, arms would be flooding into, I mean, this is the Washington Post um, uh, reporting this. It looked like, uh, my, this is a long introduction to say, uh, is preventative war justified in any case? I, I think you're. I think you're. I think you're wrong. You're wrong. Okay. I mean, so, you, so there is this argument, which is one that that's actually developed after the outbreak of war, <laughs> particularly in Russia, is that you know uh, the Ukrainians were going to uh, attack the Donbass and maybe U Ukraine. So, so this was a out of oh, uh, maybe Crimea. So this was a, a preemptive kind, kind, kind of strike. Look, uh, two problems with that. One is I don't see any actual evidence uh, for that. Yes, but the second is that's not what that's not what. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Yes, 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 yes. I, I understand. I quote that in my own article. Of course, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was part of the crisis atmosphere. And I've certainly it was certainly an influence on on Putin's decision of war. But I don't think the decision of war was based on the idea that the Ukrainians were going to attack in in, in the short term. So therefore, we, we had to launch a preemptive strike. There's no evidence there. And Putin, look, Putin didn't say that, and he's actually he still hasn't said that. I know there is this kind of argument. Well, you know, the Ukrainians were about to attack. We just preempted them, but. There's no evidence for it, and Putin hasn't claimed that. Putin's perception was not of an immediate threat of a Ukrainian attack on the Donbass or Crimea. It was a medium-term perception of a, of, 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 a, of a threat. And his calculation was that, OK, there's no short-term threat, but there is this medium-term threat, and if we actually put off military action until it actually materialises in the future, we'll be in a weaker position uh, at that, that, that time. So it's better now to... Uh, uh, yeah, but you're making uh, my argument. To not have a preventative war now rather than in the future when we'll be you're making my and that's his, that's his rationalization. And it's a perfectly rational thing. But I disagree with it. I, I, think, he, I think he was wrong. Yeah, just... But there is clearly evidence that the Biden administration was uh, pushing for um, Ukraine's um, accession to NATO. I think that there was no question that this was the policy, that they were going to go for it. Um, maybe even at the Madrid summit. And once that happened, then Russia's room for maneuver was automatically gone because then any military action against Ukraine is directly military action against NATO. And therefore that is a very serious crisis indeed. So essentially Putin saw that he had a small window uh, in which he could take action against uh, Ukraine without um, having a direct war with NATO as it is. He's got, uh, you know, a, a, at the very least an indirect war with NATO, but then it would be a, a, a real, actual direct war with NATO. George, immediate, that's okay. Uh, uh, Ukrainian membership of NATO is obviously on the agenda, been on the agenda since 2008, hadn't it? Yes. But there was no possibility or prospect of that, of that happening in the short term. For the simple reason, whether the Ukrainians and the Americans would, might desire, the French and the Germans and other, and other states in NATO were actually going, going to veto. That wasn't going to happen. And Putin knew that what wasn't going to happen. So it wasn't the, the immediate threat of Ukraine, uh, NATO, become a member of NATO, it, it, from Putin's point, it was the, it was the threat of uh, Ukraine continuing to be built up as a bridge, a NATO bridgehead, without being a member of NATO, uh, 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 directed uh, at, at, at Russia, with the possibility at some point in the future, Ukraine becoming a, a, member, a, member, a member of NATO, or indeed even you know, a nuclear arm Ukraine becoming a member of NATO. So and, and that's the context in which uh, you know, P you know, Putin uh, you know, uh, decided to, to invade. So, so my perspective is this, so this is that you seem to say it's a preemptive strike because the Ukrainians are going to evade attack and they're going to go into NATO, blah, blah, blah. I, I think it was a preventative war, not a preemptive strike. It was a preventative war. Uh, in order to avert a much more dangerous situation in the future when Ukraine would be that much more stronger because they have more arms, more training, more support, maybe in nuclear weapons. That's the, that's, that's the problem that, that uh, Putin has decided to resolve uh, through, through this, this war. Well, that's, a, that's a pretty good um, justification, far better justification than the United States had when it uh, invaded uh, Iraq. Far greater justification when the United States launched its attack on uh, Vietnam 
uh, far stronger justification when the United States launches I, I, wars in I, Central I, I, America. I, I, no, it's, it's a, I, don't, I don't think, I don't, sorry, sorry, with all due respect, I don't think it's a sufficient justification for what we've experienced in the war so far, or actually for the continuing kind of dire existential threat posed by the war in terms of the danger of, of, of some kind of nuclear, nuclear exchange. I say, okay, it's a strong justification, but it's not strong enough for that, particularly when, when you know, th there were other possibilities. Okay, you might say, oh, the, the diplomacy was never going to work, and it, well, if you don't go to war now, you're pointing it forever. I'm sure these arguments don't make well, on, on by Russian decision makers, and maybe they'd be right. I'm just like giving my, my view of it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it wasn't... It it wasn't, it wasn't necessary at the, at, at the time that, that decision was taken. Yeah, but what, well, my problem is, okay, two things, okay. Um, we know um, uh, since fe February 24th, uh, the vast majority of the fighting is in the East. That's because that's where Ukraine has its military asset. That's sure. where it was built up. Absolutely. I have ample evidence. <clears throat> um, eyewitness evidence. Um, Mary Dashevsky, a good example um, that I talked to about this. She was astounded going there before the conflict that NATO Ukrainian flags on, on, on state buildings. I mean, they, they were NATO officials working inside the, the Ukrainian military. I mean, we, have, we can, you know, being becoming a member of NATO, this is superfluous. I mean, it was a de facto member of NATO. That's what happened. And, and then you have, that's the, that's you have, sorry, hang, hang on. And you yeah. have this massive buildup of military forces in the Eastern part of the country. Now we know, and unfortunately, Western media has largely ignored it, um, the, the, the death toll of 14,000 in the Donbass since 2014. I mean, there's, there's, I mean, this is like June 1941. I mean, you can't close your eyes to this. This is, this is, this is coming right up, okay? Everything out there, to, OSCE, military buildup, arms sales and, and, and um, um, training, uh, money, all of these forces here. Now, may, maybe we'll come up with historical evidence to see this was a master um, um, catastrophe, but I don't see anything contrary to that now. And I, I still think, you know, I, I, listening to your argument, I just, I just don't. What would you want Putin to do? Like, you know, let's let's let's, let's uh, propose a, a, a more diplomatic notes and all this. When for thirty years they've just been given a cold shoulder. Why would it change? Particularly when NATO, at the behest of the United States, has put in so many assets. Okay, they had no reason to talk. They, they thought they were sitting pretty. Uh, and, okay. and, no, okay. and I think that this is- I, think I, agree with, I agree with what you're saying about the NATOization of Ukraine. And that therein lies the NATO or American Western responsibility and the Ukrainians responsibility for the war, for creating this confrontational situation and for creating this, this, you know, this, this danger. Uh, which which you know, Putin perceives in a certain way, and and, and takes and takes this action. Uh, that, okay, but all I'm saying is that you know there is no evidence uh, that the the Ukrainians were playing any kind of immediate uh, attack. If they were, it would have been completely uh, and utterly crazy. So so I don't I don't I don't buy this line that there was a, an immediate dire uh, dire threat. I do buy the line actually that there was a, a medium and long term dire threat. Uh, you know, to, to Russian security, and from that point of view, I, I can see, um, I, I, I can see the point of radical action. Okay, but you say, what should what should Putin done? I think he should have done what I think. I, I suspect we won't know until we get more evidence archives. What a lot of his advisors were, were saying to him, uh, including, I would guess, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, people like uh, you know Lavrov. And they were saying to him, well, you know, we've made some gains in diplomatically. We can continue along this path uh, and see what else, and see what else we can go. We've gained more in the last actually in the last three months, you know, from December onwards, in terms of you know, Western responses and, and concessions, small concessions, than we gained in the previous like you know ten years from the West. So so let's continue with our you know our diplomatic and political campaign. Yeah, let's keep our armed forces mobilised and you know on the border. You know let, let, let's let's you know in, engage in a bit of um, militarised uh, di diplomacy, right? So so that, that's my answer to your question. What Putin should have done? He should have. Uh, persisted with uh, with diplomacy and exhausted uh, that possibility, and I don't think that he exhausted that. Po that, that, po that but even Lavrov 
Uh, and also, maybe the other possibility is that maybe he miscalculated. Now, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't buy this line that uh, the Russians and Putin thought that the Ukrainians were going to be a pusher, but right? it's going to be an easy war. I don't buy that at all. I can't surely be that stupid. But it's quite possibly miscalculated. But Putin actually didn't realise how bad, <laughs> difficult the war was going to be, how costly it was going to be, and how potentially dangerous it was going to be. So I think maybe, I mean, actually, I think that possibly <laughs> if, if Putin knew what, you know, knew, knew then what he knows now, then I suspect he would have actually, uh, my guess would be, he would actually would have persisted uh, with the, the diplomatic approach. He would have actually taken the advice of people like me not to give up on, 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 on some kind of settlement with the but Western. That, that's, but assuming, that, that's, that's assuming that um, uh, the West was interested in some kind of parlay. I don't see any evidence. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's really the point, because... You know, the, the, the only issues that the West was prepared to discuss with the Russians was something about missile deployments. You know, in other words, going back to, you know, some new, new variation on the INF treaty. That's all that the West was willing to discuss. Whereas the real issue for the Russians, and it has been for a long time, was NATO expansion. And this was going to go on. I mean, it's, it's clear that this is NATO's agenda is you know, unlimited expansion. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been, you know, I, I do think that the, the Americans would have got in Ukraine. I don't think Germany under Olaf Scholz would have put up any serious resistance. But leave that aside. Then it would have been Georgia. Then it would have been further on into uh, Central Asia. The goal was to surround Russia with hostile states. I mean, that, that, that's the, that was the NATO agenda. Russia couldn't really sit back and just uh, tolerate this. So that's why the diplomacy wouldn't have got them anywhere. I mean, because NATO was going to do this anyway. I mean, they would have just spun this out. And that's, I think, what Putin and Lavrov both said. They're just going to keep talking, just, just talking, talking, just talking. Before, meanwhile, they're just, expanding. Just before Putin took the decision of invasion, he had a meeting with Lavrov. And it was a, you know, a 10 days before. A couple of yeah. weeks at most, it was a public, public, you know, on TV kind of meeting. And he said to Lavrov, well, where is this diplomacy uh, going? And Lavrov says, well, it's very difficult. But this is what he said, not me. You know, we have actually got some recognition. We've got some concessions. There's been some progress. And my advice to you is that we should, OK, it's pretty grim picture, but we should continue on this diplomatic track. That was, that was the advice that uh, Lavrov gave to Putin. OK, and Putin decided otherwise, you know, maybe he, he knew things <laughs> that, that Lavrov didn't know, or maybe oh, I didn't, I don't know, no, I don't, maybe, maybe, maybe new stuff. All I'm saying is that from, as an outside uh, as observer point of view, you know, I, as I say, I go back to my original point, the, the only justification for war is necessity. The only justification for this kind of war with its devastating consequences and its existential dangers for everyone is, uh, is dire necessity. And I don't think that was true uh, in, in February uh, 2023. And I also think there were some possibilities, slim possibilities, are agree with all the things you're saying about the West, and I'm, I, I, I'm, I, we shouldn't let the West off the hook for, 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 what's, for, for what's happened, but I nevertheless think there were possibilities. Now, of course, we're never going to know, are we? You know, yeah. this is kind of speculative yeah, uh, but that's uh, kind of argument. But, yeah, you, 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 in, you know, in, a sense, in a sense, it's not, you know, okay, you asked me the question, we're having the discussion, I'm happy to have it. But in a sense, from my point, the most important thing for me is not arguing the toss about, uh, you know, what, why the war and what's the war justified. It's what happens next? Where do we go from here? That's yeah, it. yeah. Well, well no, I mean, yeah. I want to make it very clear, George. It's, engaging, I mean, you know, it's historical speculation, but it, it, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, you know, we could pull out a six pack of beer and we can, you know, do that. But, you know, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, you re this dovetails exactly to what some of the things that George and I have been talking about, because oh. when we think of a, a, some kind of settlement, and I'm, I'm going to, you know, plagiarize George right now. I mean, you know, the settlement can't be, well, um, a, having whatever is left of Ukraine uh, reset the board and do it all over again in five years. I mean, this is the this is getting into some of your thinking about the outcomes of this. And, and I'm in I'm in I, I'm on your side. I'm trying to figure out the implications of this because they are uh, uh, vast. I mean, this is world historic what we're seeing in front of us right now. But because of the way the, the conflict um, has been uh, conducted is going to tell us a whole lot about the outcome here and. Um, you know the 
when you know you have these people over like a responsible statecraft and they start saying well we had should have minsk three i mean these are not serious people okay i mean ukraine is a shattered state right now yeah. and one of the things that i have posited since the first day of the conflict it's not what Kiev is going to, con it's not what Moscow is going to control. It's what Kiev is going to control. And with every passing day, without any interest, one scintilla, scintilla of interest in diplomacy, Ukraine gets smaller. And if you look at the parts of Ukraine that Kiev do no longer controls, that's 60 to 70% of their GDP prior to the conflict, 60 to 70%. Okay, and I'll leave with this here, and this is something I've been saying since 2014. The more the West helps Ukraine, the smaller it gets, and I'm being proven right. I, 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 I don't, I, I don't disagree with what you're, what you're, what you're saying, Peter. Uh, Peter. I mean, I, I think that my guess is my. My understanding is that you know Putin launched the, the special military operation, as, as he call, as he calls it, with actually quite limited uh, war aims, you know, which was to actually secure the Donbass, Greater Donbass area, uh, and to and to to smash um, um, Ukrainian NATO military power in Ukraine and 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 neutralise. Uh, and disarm um, new Ukrainian some fashion. But of course, as the war has progressed. Um, you know, you know, his war aims, Russian war aims, have actually expanded, and now that the, their, their war aims uh, go, I think, go way beyond the initially limited uh, goals of the military operation. So, there, there, in my opinion, there's, there's no, there's no way on this earth that the Russians are going to give up any territory that they have captured so far, or they capture uh, in, 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 uh, in the future. So, you know, Minsk three is a complete and utter fantasy that isn't going to happen. Yeah, you know, the issue is. Okay, I think that you know, I, don't, I, I, you know, I think Ukraine is a devastated state. I wouldn't call it a yeah. failed state yet, right? Ukraine can survive as a, as as a, as an independent uh, state. Um, the question is, you know, what will be its its territorial uh, boundaries? I think if they were willing to negotiate some kind of deal now, I think they might be able to retrieve Odessa. They might be able to retrieve Kharkov. I'm not certain about that, but, but I think that's a possibility. Uh, but you know, if if they if they continue the war, then you know, I think that they're going to lose more and more and more territory, possibly right up until the um, you know. You know the Dnieper, the line of the, the Dnieper, the whole of uh, eastern and southern Ukraine is going to come under under, under Russian uh, under, 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 under Russian control. And, and, and what, why do they persist with that position? Okay, well, one answer is that you know because they're being supported by the West, they're being urged on by the West because the West has turned it into a broader kind of existential struggle with, with Russia. But having said that, I think we need to be careful about blaming the West too much for the Ukrainians' position. You know, they have their own kind of agency here, and in, and in some ways, someone like Zelensky has quite a lot of um, political capital that he could use. To actually, really? uh, some kind. Of, well, okay, I agree. So, so what all I'm saying is that it, 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 if we are into a permanent war situation, it won't be just the choice of the West. Yeah, it will be the choice of the Ukraine, the Zelensky, or the Ukrainian nationalism. It'll be their. It'll be, uh, it will be their choice uh, as well. And I fear that that's that's what might happen. You know, there might not be a ceasefire. There might not be any peace. Right. Uh, you know, the, 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 presumably at some point the military action will die down a bit, but effectively a war situation will continue. Uh, Ukraine will try to recover. The West will keep sending weapons. The confrontation, the broader con global confrontation, will continue. And again, you know, the, the existential dangers will 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 will, 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 will remain. Yeah. But that, but that's why when you say the Russian uh, war aims have expanded, they've expanded in response to um, the West insistence to fight to the last Ukrainian, because if that's what the West is going to do, and for Russia, this is an, this is an existential battle. If the West is gonna do, in other words, we're just gonna keep this war going, which is what today, I think this Belgian prime minister said, you know, this war has to be won on the battlefield. Well, if you're gonna do that, then the Russians simply can't stop. I mean, they, they can't just simply say, okay, that's it that thus far and no further, because of course, whatever's left of Ukraine, that remnant of Ukraine is going to dream of revenge, NATO will start rearming. It's going to start lobbing missiles into uh, into the Donbass, you know, with, within within a few weeks, and then Russia will have not achieved anything. So in the way, Russia's 
expansion of its war aims, which I think by now would probably mean regime change and uh, regime change and um, you know the, you know basically control the borders. I think that has been a force upon Russia as a result of the West's absolute insistence of trying to defeat Russia in Ukraine. Yeah, I, I agree with you to a certain extent. Yeah, I think Russian war aims have ex expanded, you know, radicalized, if you like, in response to you know, the Western position of the war. But it's not just that. It's also the nature of the war itself, the conduct of the war, what's happened during the course of the war, right? The territorial, the, the additional territorial expansion which the Russians have had to undertake in order to conduct their military operations, to deal with the military situation. And having kind of like expanded in certain territories uh, you know, <laughs> and created certain expectations on the part of you know, the local populations, including lots of populations that support the Russian position, they're not they're now going to, you know, then, you know, withdraw from those territories as a result of, uh, of some kind of a diplomatic settlement. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, it is a response to the Western confrontational existential uh, uh, struggle tactics, but it's also, it, it's in, it's in the, in the nature of the war process itself, the radicalization has occurred, yeah. And, and that, that's very typical, by the way, of, of wars and, and, of, and of these, 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 these kind of situations. So, so I'm not surprised by it uh, at all. But still, yeah, but you, you still, it's not, okay, it's, you know, the war could come to an end. You know, if the, if, the war, if, if the war continues for however long, if you can confirm it, that won't be an inevitability or a necessity. That will be a political choice, right? It will be a political choice by the West. It will be a political choice by uh, the Ukrainians. Also, to a certain extent, a political choice by the Russians, although I, I think that the Russians would, you know, okay, I think, in, in a way, yeah, actually, maybe this is an interesting point, is that on the Western Ukrainian side, they have, in principle, unlimited war aims. Their war aims are unlimited. Okay, you know, they might be forced to, <laughs> to give up some of these aims in, 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 in practice, but their, their war aims are unlimited. Defeat Russia in Ukraine, defeat Russia globally, existentially, or whatever. The Russian size, I don't think the, 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 the aims are un, unlimited. Right? They've been radicalized for sure. They're, they're, they're much more expansive. <laughs> Uh, than they were were, were you know, before the war, war began, but I think yeah, I think I think Russia will be prepared to settle for you know Eastern Ukraine, Southern Ukraine, a peace settlement, or they would be prepared to do so. So 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 in, so in that sense, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that's, certainly, I mean, point, be... that's certainly a point in Russia's favour, if you like. So the Russian war aims are quite radical, quite expansive, ambitious in some ways, but they're not unlimited like the Ukrainian and the Western war aims. Well, I like. I... Yeah, I, they're limited, but limited in the sense that they don't have to do this again for another generation. Not five years, okay? Not five weeks, not five months. It had, there has to be, and it will be a unilateral se uh, settlement. That's what I'm predicting right now because there's no Western interlocutor. And I, and I think that Zelensky is a clownish figure. I mean, the, how irresponsible to watch your, your army being grinded up, your population, destitute when you if he has agency which i don't think he has okay he wasn't built up that way and so the the for the, the settlement will have to be in russia's mind Wait, let's go back to the beginning of all of this here why did this happen because russia believed and it presented its case very adamantly fervently that its security requirements were not being um, not, 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 certainly not being met, but not even recognized as being legitimate. Now, the outcome of this, uh, this uh, conflict will be Russia unilaterally deciding how to protect its um, uh, uh, national interest as it defines it, because the West is not an interlocutor to discuss that, okay? Now, all of this gobbledygook that came out of Blinken and, and Liz Truss and all of these other amateurish people, okay? So Russia's gonna say, no, this is what we decided, okay? And it will be an outcome in which they will calculate the revenge that George referenced will not be a possibility. Yeah, Peter, I think yeah, the, the problem with your, your argument, your position is that it, it, its logic is one of permanent and total war. On the basis of your argument, oh, we've got to definitively solve this problem or the danger in the future, for a generation. Yeah, and that, that, yeah, for a generation. You don't stop at the Dnieper. You actually, you, you, you need to conquer the whole of Ukraine. And actually, but why, why stop at the Ukraine? 
What about the Baltic states? What about what about Poland? Yeah, that's the. Uh, so, well, then you will have a very different NATO, I would say, because uh, NATO is uh, well, defeated. Yeah, okay, and then yeah, right. So yeah, you you hope that the West is going to break up. They're going to be in crisis. All no, this. Kind of, I'm not, you know, I'm not going that. Far. No, no, no. At some point, at some point, you have to. Uh, at some point, at some point, and actually, I have to say. I, 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 I actually don't believe that Putin has or will ever uh, embrace your kind of uh, view, Peter. I think there are some like radical Russian nationalists who, yeah, obviously there's a lot of talk about it in Russia, for sure, for sure, yeah, for sure, people do what they believe. I don't think that'd be Putin's position. At some yeah, point, but, but Russia Jeff, that's and not Putin, a, that's Russian to, not a Russian nationalist position, that's, that's a point. security but, position, please. You know, Russia and Putin is going to have to take a chance on peace. They're going to have to take a chance on a peace which won't be definitive, will have dangers, will maybe they'll come back again at us. Some point they, they're going to have to do that. And they're going to have to do that to actually to protect Russia and its interests. It's, it's not in Russia's interest to be in a state of permanent and total warfare. Yeah, no, yes. it's not. It's not though no, they need to stop that. They need to at least they need to at least be able to coexist. <laughs> But, but, but if we, we can, West, even if they don't interact with them very much from yeah, so, so, yeah, 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 two if, parties no but if, yeah, parties. that's the thing if you look at the, the west the west has seized this opportunity they think they can use this war essentially to do russia in once and for all that this basically we've got russia on the ropes we can just go on draining them you know of their resources Hitting them with with economic sanctions, and eventually they're going to come down to their knees. In other words, they do and the US and George, now George, as a way to do uh, Russia in one. No, no, no. And George, what you and Peter are actually arguing is that is that Russia should, should actually engage with the fight that the West wants to wage. That's what you're what you're saying, right? Of course, and that, that position you're you're espousing is the position which is what the you know the neocons, the the, the Russophobes, yeah. Extremists, the real extremists on the West. That's exactly the scenario that they want to actually materialize. And in and in making this kind of argument, or pushing this kind of view, in a small kind of way, and I'm not, I'm not saying you attend to that. You're actually a, you're, you're giving your aid and sucker to you know, to to the enemies of Russia, the real enemies, the extremist enemies of Russia uh, on, on the Western side. So we need to, you know, Russia needs to break that kind of logic, and I think they will. I I I, I, I don't believe that. Well, well, that yeah. Russia is going to. I think Russia is going to going to stop the military operations at a certain point. Maybe after they've taken Odessa, maybe Kharkov, maybe even before that, and then they're going to try and uh, work through some kind of. Then they just, if you just answer, then what happens? To uh, the fact that if the Zelensky gang stays in Kiev, they're going to want revenge. They're going to go on fighting. They're going to go on lobbing missiles. And Liz Truss and Boris Johnson are going to be telling him, yeah, yeah, don't settle for this. Yeah, don't, but they're only going to, just they are, they're only, yes, sure, but they're only going to sustain that position in a, in a real practical sense with Western support. And I don't, actually, I really don't think the West, and certainly not in Europe anyway, is going to be up for you know, uh, a, a, a truncated Ukraine building itself up again to have another go at Russia. I, I actually don't believe that's going to be the case. I think that if that if that's what happens, the, the, the West will abandon. Well, and it, and it, if, it, if, the West, if the West abandons Ukraine, it's game over. They're never going to be able to recover a position to threaten Russia uh, again. Yeah, but th that's why this is all existential here. You're again, you're agreeing with our position here. Okay, oh, I, I'd say. You no, know, if you listen, you know, George, you know, Jeff, when people tell you who they are, believe them. Okay, believe them. This is, you know, uh, Lloyd Austin. This is a co conflict to weaken Russia. Okay, that wasn't a slip of the tongue. Okay, this is this is existential. It's messianic. Putin cannot win. And th th I think that they're in, in they're in a, I was going to say intellectual, certainly not. They're in an ideological cul-de-sac because they are on the verge of a catastrophic defeat. And that is untenable and unacceptable and it will be used as a distraction for all of the woes that are being experienced in the West. What you and George are arguing is a strategy, a policy, a perspective of total victory, right? What I'm arguing for is... Uh, is some kind of peace settlement, right? In which you know, Russia doesn't get everything, doesn't get all the guarantees it wants, but it gets enough uh, to- uh, Guarantees to from whom? From whom? Who do you believe now? After 30 years of this? Okay, but on that, okay, so on that basis, there's never gonna be any agreements, never gonna be any deal. 
it's you know, it's it's war forever, basically. That's what you're saying. No, that's but, that's but, that's but that's I mean, that's 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 you think we're going to really survive that scenario? Whom do you believe? I mean, you know, not. I mean, we're talking about all the the you know the guarantees that were issued to, uh, or at least the promises that were made to Gorbachev. But we're even talking about something more recently, which is the the Minsk Accords. It's clear Ukraine, Poroshenko says, we had no intention of fulfilling Minsk. It's clear from even from that phone conversation with Macron that, you know, just before the, the start of the special military operation, clear Macron had no intention of facilitating Minsk. The Germans had no intention. So even on this small thing of the Minsk Accords, the West just made promises that they had no intention of, uh, of keeping. So, <laughs> like, I guess, so again, like, you know, they're going to make another promise. Yeah, we, we definitely promise that, you know, we're not going to start uh, seeking some kind of a, a revenge uh, for, uh, for Ukraine. Uh, uh, people on the other side of this argument, on the Western side, they say the same thing as you about Putin and Russia. They say, well, how, well, how can we, we can just say the same thing. We can't have peace with Russia, we can't have Russia because we can't uh, trust Russia. Uh, he promises yes well okay the only way to to resolve that kind of argument you know can i decide to be, be trust is to actually is to do the deal and see what happens yes but but try, what reagan used to say you know trust but verify and also you know keep your options open for a resumption of conflict and war if that in the future which is why of course states particularly big states like russia keep uh, you know have big military establishment they have armies they have like coercive power even though they might not be any un under any immediate threats for anyone uh, but that's what that's what they do yeah so yeah i i yeah I, you want to continue the war no. i want I, I i i want the war to end as soon as possible and i want some kind of peace deal no. negotiate settlement compromises on all sides and risks on all sides including risks on the russian side of what, what i want nothing I want an end to this conflict. I want peace. I don't want to see Ukrainian. How are you going to do that? Later. How's that going to happen, Peter? I don't how, want how, to, how are you going I to get peace. I don't want to see this happen again. That, that's the point I'm making. Okay. There has to be Russia's security requirements in Europe have to be acknowledged, accepted, and be given legitimacy. That has not been the case since the end of the Cold War and the expansion of NATO. There is no evidence that NATO has ever recognized Russia's security interests. Why should it change now? Okay. That's what they need to do to convince the Russians that they're actually legitimate. Michael McFall. During the Munk um, um, debate, I guess it was last month, George, six weeks Please. ago, he was he he openly admitted, yes, our diplomats lie all the time. Well, then how do you deal with these people? Okay, now now the Russians the Russians lie all of the time. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's that's part to, of a they, they However, two reasons. Firstly. The West hang on, is, hang on, let me finish. The West, is, the West is losing. The West is losing. Right? Of course it is. Right. And the second reason they are trying, it's just as much in the Western interest as it is in the Russian interest, and also even more so the Ukrainian interest, to end this war and have kind, have some kind of settlement peace, even if you know, Russia gains a lot of a lot, lot of territory, even if the Western NATO have the humble pie and have to accept uh, you know, Russian, give Russia security guarantees, and even if the Ukrainians have to accept their permanent disarmament and, and neutralization. That, that's a very bitter pill for everyone. Right. But the point oh, is that, yeah, but no, that's, that's, that's what needs to happen. I'm not saying it will. I mean, the chances are, you know, you know, the, the, your position, you know, the, 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 the pro war position. What's not uh, a pro war As opposed to a pro peace. But the point position, is, yeah, the prevail. But, and all the time, I mean, this crisis, as you wrote, you know, that essay, the crisis has been, you know, building for a long time. Sure. And during this time, Russia gave constant, constant offers to the West, made, you know, saying, you know, well, look, let's, let's work something out. You know, let's work out a new uh, Helsinki Accord. This went on and on for month after month. And, and essentially, Russia got the back of its hand. I mean, the, the nature's position was simply, no. We are going to expand. No one tells us what to do, and no one tells us uh, who, who, who can and who can't join NATO. And right up to the very end, when it was obvious how serious the crisis was, the West was absolutely refusing to do this, refusing even to rule out. I mean, you said that there were yeah, no but, plans to bring Ukraine into NATO. The they, were, they were refusing the even to make the that. The situation change. has completely changed. We have this war in Ukraine with its that's, enormous costs and consequences. That's what, I mean, that's what, I mean, you know, yeah, in, in a sense, if Russia gets any concessions from the West, 
it will be because it's gone to war at a huge cost. And, you know, of course, and you might argue that justifies right. the military. <laughs> that the cost relative to the gain doesn't justify, and that maybe significant gains could have been done without war. Okay, but that, that's the argument we, we, uh, we've had, had had already. So we're in a new a new kind of scenario where, you know, maybe not immediately, you know, but in the coming period, the West will be prepared to make concessions that would have been unimaginable. Is, uh, there, is there evidence for that? In you, the past. Do you, do you see evidence of that? Do you see evidence that the West is, is prepared to make those concessions? I, well, I think there are certainly, there's certainly, uh, okay, there is this Western United Front, yes? But there are different opinions, there are different positions on the Western side in different countries. So there's certainly plenty of you know, people, <laughs> including like decision makers, political leaders in, in all kinds of different countries, politicians, who actually don't agree with this confrontational policy and actually would favour uh, favor peace. So I think there are forces for peace within NATO and the Western Bloc, as well as uh, forces for war. And the more uh, the war goes against Ukraine, the more catastrophic it becomes for Ukraine, and the more the Western policies of confronting Russia, the sanctions, the more they fail, I think you know, the stronger uh, the stronger that the peace party in the West will grow. So, so, so yeah, so that, that, that would be uh, you know, you know, you know, the evidence there. Um, but, but, I mean, but ultimately, in one way, um, I think what might force some kind of resolution of the situation is if we do actually get to some actual nuclear confrontation, oh, maybe yeah. over Lithuania, you know, in this blockade, or maybe in relation to Poland, or whatever else might be the case, right? And then what, what will confront, you know, the EU, France, and Germany in particular, will be the spec specter of, a real spectre, big spectre of a nuclear war. And it won't be fought on Russian territory. It won't be fought on the United States. The Russians and America are not going to dis- uh, obliterate each other out of existence. Now, if there's an escalation of nuclear war, that will be a battlefield, initially a battlefield nuclear war fought on uh, yeah, European, on, in, on Europe. I think that's the scenario which they will turn and say, no, actually, we'll take the deal. Yeah, we'll take yeah, okay. the risks. We'll make, yeah, we'll make concessions, yeah. We'll do whatever it takes to actually avoid our societies being obliterated. For what? So that Ukraine can keep fighting. Do we really want to do that? Well, there's a certain but, but logic Jeff, there. Jeff, I mean, obviously, the, your scenario is, is a terrifying one. And, 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 and It's not unrealistic. That's, the, that's really terrifying. But, but, I mean, let's take a step back. Um, Look what the European Union is doing to its economies because of this. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I mean, the, the pro- Germany's pride and joy since the Second World War is its economy. That's what makes it proud on the, on the world stage. Not military. Look, you can say finance to some degree. And they're willing to, to uh, crush that over Ukraine at the behest of of the UK that's not even in the European Union anymore and the United States. I mean, I don't don't understand the the, the mentality of these people. They are willing to to destroy so much of what they've built. They're willing to part with prosperity. The European Union is already struggling and now they're going to add this on. I listen to these politicians and I'm just astounded, astounded what, what they're willing to do and, and, and what, what security value is Ukraine to the European Union? What? Never been explained. Yeah, but there, there is, I mean, so the reason why I say that, Jeff, is that, you know, the specter of a nuclear conflict, I mean, I guess it is in the cards because these people are acting so irrationally. Yeah. There, there, is, there is a certain logic to their position, which is this, uh, which if they back away from this, right? If Russia gets what it wants in Ukraine and in terms of wider security issues, whatever it might be, yes. And effectively wins the war, comes out of a of, of victor, even though the victory might be you know, hugely, hugely costly. That will be a devastating, crushing defeat for the West, for NATO, for the EU, for the Western states, right? Their credibility shot through. There's even the possibility that in that, in that scenario that, that you know, the, the, the Western bloc itself could disintegrate or break up. Okay, maybe, maybe that's not going to happen. So from the Western point of view, there's a huge amount that's at stake in this situation, which is why they're, they're, they're continuing 
to support Ukraine, they're continuing with this confrontation with Russia. But I, I'm not, con- I don't, I'm not that convinced they can, they can, they can um, sustain it. It depends what happens in Ukraine. It depends on what, how the military situation in Ukraine. If, if, if Russia effectively wins, wherever it might be, wins militarily in Ukraine, and then you're looking at a, a rump Ukraine continuing a kind of losing war with uh, Russia over many years. In that perspective. Yeah, you know, when when there's all these accumulation economic problems and, and social and political problems, in that perspective, I think you know there will be a, a shift in, in, in Western politics in, in relation, uh, you know, in, in, in relation to, what, to to what's going on. But that by yeah. that point, the calculation will change. Yeah, it, backing away will still be and it's a, a huge uh, defeat, but actually continuing continuing right. with that same policy will, will lead to an even bigger series of defeats. But it's interesting because if that does happen, let's say Russia does achieve this crushing victory. In other words, the, the Ukrainian army just simply cannot go on. I mean, it's just simply being devastated by, by the Russian attacks. And essentially, you know, what yeah. you've got is just this you know, rump yeah. state cannot go on fighting. Well, in that case, if Russia does achieve this great military victory, the entire geopolitical calculation of the world changes. Sure. And then you might say Putin's war was justified. Because the alternative would have been a continuing NATO expansion, a continuing essentially encirclement, because that which got the goal, the encirclement of Russia, diminution of Russia as any kind of a great power that can exert itself in the world. It, 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 and, it, and basically now NATO has suffered a humiliating loss. Yeah, Russia is a great power. It's seen off NATO. The war George, would have been justified. It depends on what it depends on what, on what the actual new world is like, doesn't it? Yeah, right. You know, if that happens, I would envision this would be a new light in which there would be massive armament, armaments build up all around, yes? This would be a world in which many other countries would actually start to uh, acquire uh, 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 nuclear weapons as well. This would be a kind of fragmented world, yeah? They'll be okay, okay, the West would have suffered defeat, Russia will be destroyed as a great power, maybe even, you know, Russia and China, you know, they have this multi multipolar world, but it might not be a very hospitable world, you know, from their point of view, Russia as, as well as from, from the Western point of view. So it all depends, you know, what happens, you know, yeah? if it turns out badly, then people are going to be, going to be saying, oh yeah, Jeff Roberts was right. It, was, it wasn't worth the candle, right? It was Putin. Yeah, but, I mean, she was continuing with diplomacy, rather than this world which has had this, which has created this, uh, this terrible world with all these terrible dangers, nuclear dangers, yes? And, and a failure, a breakdown of cooperation, you know, climate, uh, you know, no cooperation on climate change, no cooperation on development, yeah, all that kind of stuff like that. So, yeah, but one of the that. one a, a positive outcome there is, I, I think there could be a positive outcome here. I, I know it's it's a big ask, but and it's something that should have happened a long time ago. Is that the Europeans basically become a power among uh, uh, to themselves? They have to break the hege- American hegemony and be part of a multipolar world. And I think the Russians would perfectly accept that, okay? Where you have peaceful coexistence. As a matter of fact, we, you said, you know, the, the proliferation of arms, it could go in the reverse direction. This conflict would say, look, we need to militarize all, you know, Portugal to the Urals, we just, no more, okay? They, they're, 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 no, 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 it's no, no, creative no. thinking out there. We, NATO right. is the problem. NATO is the problem, what we, and we go back, through the first couple years of, of Putin's uh, um, time in power. And then you had um, uh, Medvedev when he was president, constantly saying, we need to reorganize the European security architecture, okay? And go no, from Portugal to the Urals. It was a dead letter in the West, okay? Maybe this catastrophic uh, conflict may give uh, an impetus to rethinking that. I, think I, 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 I agree with that. You're absolutely right, right? The desired outcome to this war situation is a multipolar world based on uh, peaceful coexistence, right? Which is precisely why I, I'm absolutely convinced Putin, at least, at least some of his advisors are not going to go down the war path that you 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 are you seem to be suggesting. That's why they're going to be they're, they're, they're going to limit their expansion, their aims, their war. Right? They're going to be prepared to do a deal. They're going to make concessions. Yeah, uh, because they know that you know if it's a permanent war situation, 
you know, you, okay, you might have a, a multipolar world, but it's going to be a very dangerous multipolar world. If you want a, a multipolar world with peaceful coexistence, with cooperation, collaboration, which was the world, of course, which Putin and the Russians <laughs> were striving for all along, you know, ever since the end of the USSR and throughout the whole world, that's the world they want. And they must know they're not going to get that kind of world if they... If, if, if they pursue too militaristic and too militant and ra radical policy. No, they might, not, they might be, they got no... It's not might, Russia also, expanded. The Chinese, the Chinese, the Chinese, the Chinese, hang on, the Chinese, the Chinese. Yeah, the Chinese want a multipolar world. They want a world based on peaceful coexistence, right? The Chinese are going to be another factor uh, in favour of, 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 you know, of ending the war. Right of, of cutting through the logic of of warmongering, right, and uh, uh, do having some kind of compromise uh, compromise peace, yeah. Right. That's the, thing. So that's, that's the case. The problem is, and it always goes back to the West, which is that the West does not, particularly the United States, does not just stop. I mean, what was the, their interpretation of the Cold War? We won the Cold War. Um, not that the Soviets just basically said enough already. We won the Cold War. Now we must enjoy the fruits of this victory. That means we're going to scoop up all of uh, Russia's former allies, bring them into our alliance, go grab a chunk of uh, Russian Federation as well. So any outcome when they say, oh, we'll settle for half a loaf in Ukraine, how will the, you know, the United States interpret this? We've defeated Putin. We need to go on defeating Putin because Putin is a malign actor and we can't go on living in a world with this malign Putin still in power, doing his malign things against everybody. So we have to go on fighting against the malign Putin. That's what okay. the United States will do. So you that's, know that's how the that's, United that's, States. Okay, so that's the logic of war mongering on the Western side, yeah? So, so you know, the, the logic of war mongering from the Russian side is, 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 is that you have this malign kind of west which can't be trusted it's always going to be uh, it's always it's always going to be locked into or uh, threatening or wanting to destroy russia or whatever it might be so that those are the two logics now we need to, we, we, you know, we, we need to step away from both of the, 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 those logics we need to you know we, we need to stand for an end to the war some kind of peace settlement and i agree with you the west bears an enormous responsibility here what the west should do they should stop that they, they should stop supplying uh, Ukraine with arms. They should be urging and pressurizing Ukrainians um, in, 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 into you know, uh, a ceasefire and peace peace negotiation. And if the Ukrainians don't do that, well, then they'd be it on their head. And of course, they can sweeten the pill in various ways to, to do that. So that's the, that's the Western responsibility. And yeah, but Jeff, they're Jeff, Jeff, but, the Russian, but the Russians also have responsibility here. Let me finish this point. The Russians have responsibility. Their responsibility is to, at some point, you know, curtail their military operations voluntarily, right? And allow the continued um, existence of an independent Ukraine and to be prepared to make various like compromises in, 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 in relation to that new situation, which has been created, uh, you know, created, created by the war. So there are responsibilities uh, on both sides here. Responsibility on the Russian side is to actually limit its war aims and peace aims. The responsibility on the Western side is to stop stoking, uh, you know, this military catastrophe. Well, there's, the, there's no yeah. evidence of this. We had the G7 with great fanfare. Um, uh, that's the, the most, from what I understand, it was uh, Ukraine and a little bit of uh, climate change, okay? That was their big agenda. Now we have the NATO confab in, in Madrid, same thing. Um, they're not learning anything from this here. And the, the, the thing that, is- that's, that's actually not quite true. There, there has been a change, shift in the discourse, a change in the time, right? Now, you know, now, yeah, until recently it was all, yeah, Ukraine's gonna win, We everything to victory. Now there's more and more talk about, well, maybe Ukraine can't win and uh, maybe that there, there will need to be a ceasefire. There need to be some kind of settlement. Ukraine will have to accept territorial loss. Of course, they say, well, of course, yeah, they, they, they shouldn't accept too many territorial losses. But obviously, that's not going to be. No, 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 no. But there, so by Russia, there's an important distinction here. Okay, is that um, Ukraine must make compromises, but Putin must be defeated. They can't work at the same time. And this is the discourse that we have in the West. George was absolutely is absolutely right on this point. You know, you you know, we heard Biden, George, what ten days ago, two weeks ago, basically hinting that you know they can throw Zelensky under the bus. Okay, he didn't listen to us. Okay, remember that. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but at the same, but at the same time, 
there's the, the, the it's, it's messianic. It's 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 a pathology here. The, the the fact of not losing Ukraine because it's not about Ukraine. Losing to Russia. That's the problem here. They need to adjust that here. As far as the Russian side is concerned, I think it's all white noise to them, Jeff. I'm, at this point, it's just all white noise because what matters is the political facts created on the ground, and that's how you're going to get a basis. Well, actually, for the, what's, the what's, ha what's happening in the West is that it's a dawning realization that Putin can't be defeated. Russia can't be defeated. Uh, Russian military gains are getting, are getting bigger and bigger in uh, in Ukraine. There's a very real danger of a of a Ukrainian collapse, not just militarily or economically, but also so 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 socially as well. In the yep. face of that changing reality, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you, your argument is, oh well, they, they don't care about that. They won't see that. Well, if you're right, then yeah, that, then then we're in for a long, long, very long, long war, a very long, long struggle, right? But if I'm right, I think that you know, <laughs> They will change their views, or at least there'll be sufficient voices on their side to affect uh, you know, a shift in a shift in policy to actually deal with the new realities. I mean, and you know, there are plenty of influential voices urging this. I mean, Kissinger. I mean, Kissinger's um, uh, you know, speech at, 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 at Davos. Uh, but Kissinger's not really an influential voice. I mean, if you're talking about influential voices, he represents, you have to talk about he rep Kissinger represents a certain strand of realist kind of like thinking. In the US and in the US uh, establishment, it's certainly it's certainly there. I agree at the moment. You know, it's you know the the, the existentialists, the essentialists, are are in, in the dry drying seat. But you know their policy is is not working, is it? You know, it's not working. It's not working. That doesn't matter. It's I'm not sorry. working. For, it's not even working for themselves. Well, I think it will matter in the end, and I hope it matters before we get to the point of nuclear nuclear war. That's all I know. Okay, but Jeff, but Jeff, I think you know we have to put this all into context here, um, and I think you would agree on this point at least. On February twenty fourth, the world changed, and the and the Russians know there's no way going back because the way I look at it. They've been planning for something like this for eight years, okay? Eight years. And that's one of the reasons why, at least now, um, on the 29th of this month, as I sit in Moscow, things are buoyant, things are basically okay, all right? Because they were, they were prepared for the sanctions and all that. But there, as much as you know, people wanna say, we need to you know, mince three and all this, this is just childish talk, okay? The Russians know that there's, there's, that's a dividing line and they're prepared to accept it. They're, they, they're prepared themselves for it, okay? The West doesn't have its bearings right now. It really is doing everything ad hoc. It's extremely emotional. It's, it, everything is boomeranging on them. It's, it's um, the law of unintended consequences. And that's what makes them an unreliable partner if I can use that word. Well, that, that's, that's very grim. Crimson yes. being painted. I, I, yeah. uh, I, I think the world is changing, yes, but <laughs> the, the nature of that change, you know, can be shaped, can go in, in, in different kind of directions, yeah. And I don't see your scenario of basically, you know, complete estrangement of Russia and the West, separation, you know. I do. I, I put that that's certainly a possible scenario and even a likely scenario, but it's not it's not actually a desirable scenario. It's not desirable. Oh, I didn't say it was desirable. Russia. It's not a desirable scenario for the West, or for the rest. Certainly not a desirable uh, scenario for, for for the Ukrainians. So I think that you know we you know we have to. Well, you know, I'm resistant to this kind of you know even though my feelings I feel what you're saying, but I'm kind of like resistant to this kind of like pessimistic system. There was this uh, famous you know, slogan which is usually attributed to you know. Um, um, uh, and uh, Gramsci, yeah, you know, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the world. That was that was his kind of uh, it, that was the kind of, kind of watchword. So yeah, so I think yeah, we need to be realistic and pessimistic, if you like. It is a very pessimistic situation in, in, in terms of our thinking, but we also need to be optimistic in terms of you know, you know uh, of political action and and, and and possibilities which you know may ameliorate you know the gloomy kind of like scenario that we see materializing. Yeah. So, well, anyway, so, I mean, I think um, I think this has been a, a fascinating discussion, uh, Jeff. I think you know we had a, a lively exchange of views, and um, you know we, we had some disagreements, as as you know to be expected. And I think you know we've we've I, I know I've learned a great deal. So so thank you so much for giving me your time.
And if I, on, in, in, to end here, uh, Jeff, you, uh, the three of us have just proven that you can have a very civil and intellectual conversation about something that is very important without um, a, a constant reference and falling back on emotion. And that's why I really enjoyed this conversation because it was actually meaningful and not a waste of time, like so much you hear in the, in the mainstream I media. Think, I hope that we can, we can do it again. I hope so too, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. maybe when the war situation, like, I mean, it's in transition at the moment. It's not quite clear where it's going to end up. And, I, and again, I, mean, I think in the next, next couple of months, I would yes. say. We and can on a personal level, level yeah. Yeah. So maybe we can come back and have another discussion then about Absolutely, it. yeah. Okay. And on a personal level, I, I would love to discuss some of your, some of the historical questions we often talk about. I, I'm and up I, I was always trying to persuade Peter uh, to have uh, you know, historical discussions on crosstalk. All he was interested in was current affairs and you know, Ukraine. No, no, no. no but, all but this stuff if, like that. Yeah. If we get some kind of stability in the world, then we'll all buy stakes for all of us because George, what you just suggested, that when, when Jeff is in Moscow, Dima Babich joins us, we go to my favorite steakhouse, and we do exactly what you're proposing. Right. Uh, talking about you know, perce um, uh, perceptions and knowledge of Stalin. Dima, it was wonderful adding that to it. We have uh, perhaps, wonderful perhaps before conversation. Before we go, perhaps before we go, can, can we advertise my latest book? Yeah? Sure. Yeah, Stalin's... Um, oh, yeah, you told library. me it was... A, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Stalin, Stalin's library, dictator in his box. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, in February, on the eve of the Russian invasion of, 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 of Ukraine, yeah. Right. Uh, Peter, I have, a, I have a copy, a special copy for you, which I will... Um, um, which I will drop off to you when I'm in next time in Moscow, which hopefully won't be in the not too distant future. And George, I've got a copy for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Send me your address. You're in Budapest. Yeah? Yes, I'm Budapest. Yeah, yeah. I'd, yeah. I'd love to read it. Absolutely. But I think I can. I can. The postal system to Budapest is okay. Yeah, it That's still it. works. Yeah. Just check it. Yeah. Just check it. Yeah. 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 Obviously, it's impossible. Well, actually, even before the war, I would never trust my books to the Russian postal system. Yeah. <laughs> I always be able to hand it. So, so yeah. So, uh, I, no, I'd love to read it. Yeah. 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 Okay. So Stalin's Wars, a Stalin's Library. <laughs> it's okay for these books. Thank you, thank you so much, Jeffrey. And we we'll look forward to um, you know discussing this again, you know, within the next couple of months as the war, as the war situation uh, becomes a little clearer. So thank you, everybody. And remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you all soon. Thank you very much. Thanks.